Who Write the Bible? Part 4 Chapter 7 The Gospel of John and the Greek Philosophy 1. The Sudden Appearance of John's Gospel As we mentioned earlier, the first person that mentioned the existence of a Bible written by one of the disciples of Christ was Irenaeus in the year 180. Some claim that because of the emergence of heresies at the time of John, the disciple, the church fathers of Asia Minor, asked John to write a gospel to respond to these heresies. But this claim is false and has no evidence. Besides, how no church in Asia Minor, or any other church anywhere else has heard about the existence of this gospel if they were the ones who asked John to write it? Why did not any of the church fathers in the first century or at the beginning of the second century cite it, while well, we find that the first indication of its existence was in the year 180? 2. Using the Gospel of John to respond to the deniers of the deity of Christ and heresies. All the information that reached the current church about heresies that appeared in the late 1st and 2nd centuries depends on what Irenaeus wrote in his book, Against Heresies. Although the original copy of, Against Heresies, never reached the church and the church has relied on a Latin translation of it, the church believed all that was mentioned in that Latin translation. Even though the church neither knew who was Irenaeus nor who translated that Latin translation. Irenaeus launched a war against a number of the early church fathers and many of the early Christian groups, and many of the Gospels, which were widespread and were attributed to any of the disciples of Christ. On this, Irenaeus called one of the Christian groups Ebionites, which means the poor, and criticized them and their creed calling it the heresy of the Ebionites. He also criticized their Gospel calling it, Gospel of the Ebionites. Irenaeus also criticized Martian and his doctrine, calling it the heresy of Martian and criticized the gospel that Martian was following, which was widespread in many countries and churches, and called it, Gospel of Martian. Irenaeus also criticized Cyrenthus and the gospel that Cyrenthus was following and called it the, Gospel of Cyrenthus. Irenaeus also criticized Carpocrates, who was also following the, Gospel of Cyrenthus, and criticized Saturninus, and Basilides, and their beliefs. Thus, Irenaeus criticized many of the early church fathers and wrote about them and their beliefs. Therefore, we do not know what they believed in except for what Irenaeus wrote about them, and as for their writings, nothing of them did reach us. Based on this, we will never know whether they were heretics or if they were on the right creed because we will never be able to reach their authentic writings and sayings. As for the current church, it repeats the words of Irenaeus without questioning any of what he mentioned. For example, the current church says about Cyrenthus that the early church fathers criticized him and criticized his heresy, but if you search more on this topic, you will found out that the church means by, the early church fathers, only Irenaeus. Irenaeus relied mainly on the Gospel of John in his responses to all what he called heresies. Based on this, it is very likely, as we mentioned earlier that he attributed the Gospel which he was following it and quoting from it, to John the disciple of Christ. And claimed that his teacher Polycarp was a disciple of John so that his saying becomes the correct saying in front of people and to establish the doctrine that he sees is that it is the correct. Creed. 3. The difference between the Gospel of John and the other three Gospels. The Church calls the three Gospels Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the bodily Gospels, while the Gospel of John calls the spiritual Gospel. The Church also calls the three Gospels Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels, because they are similar, they include many of the same stories. Often in a similar sequence and in similar or sometimes identical wording. This similarity is known as the synoptic problem, and these three Gospels stand in contrast to the Gospel of John, whose content is mainly distinct. Therefore, the Gospel of John is called the independent Gospel. For the reason for writing the Gospel of John, the author of this Gospel explains the purpose of writing it in chapter 20 verse 31, 31 but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Thus, the Church sees that this Gospel was written to prove the divinity of Christ and that He is the Messiah expected by the Jews. Whereas the other Gospels did not proclaim the divinity of Christ, we find that the Gospel of John began by claiming the deity of Christ, in chapter 1 verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 5. The place of writing the Gospel of John and its writing style. Scholars differed significantly in determining the place of writing, as it was said that it might have been written in Ephesus, Antioch, or in Alexandria, Egypt as the oldest manuscript copied from it was found in Alexandria, and this gospel bears a Hellenic, Greek, character that fits Alexandria's thought affected by Philo. Of Alexandria, the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher, 20 BCE, 45 CE. 6. The author of the Gospel of John was quoting from the Greek philosophy. John's gospel began with the words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
In reality, however, the first who invented the term word, logos in Greek yo, was the Greek philosopher Heraclitus who lived from 535 to 475 BC. He considered the word as the whole law of the universe and also said that the world was in a fluid state and was incoherent, but the impersonal and unchanging divine logos held it tightly and led the process of change. Many Greek philosophers have used the term word in different ways, and among these philosophers, Aristotle, the Sophists, and Plato who defined the word as the impersonal and unchanging logos kept the planets in their orbits and defined the seasons. Also, the term word was used by the Stoic philosophers, who defined it as the moving divine principle that permeates the universe, and also defined it as the effective principle in the world or, the mind of the world, or its director, and it is the one who popularizes life in the world, and organizes the negative element in the world that is the material. Dot. In Hellenic Judaism, i.e., Judaism influenced by Greek philosophy and culture, Philo of Alexandria, the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher, adopted this term in Jewish philosophy, and he defined it as the first force emanating from God, and that it is the place of all images, and the first paradigm of all things, and it is the inner force that revives things and connects them. It interferes in the formation of the world, but it is not a creator. It is the mediator between God and people, and it guides the people and enables them to rise to see God. But its role is always the role of the mediator. Philo defined the word, logos, as deity but distinguished it from God by using the definite article that is added to God, the deity. And did not use definite article to logos. As for the writer of the Gospel of John, he defined the term word as being the God himself, and then defined Christ as the incarnate word. Seven church fathers who followed and supported the Gospel of John were all influenced by Greek philosophy and the apocryphal Jewish books. 1. Many of the early church fathers were influenced by Philo of Alexandria, the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher. As mentioned above, the Gospel of John bears a Hellenic, Greek, character and is influenced by the writings of Philo of Alexandria, the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher. Philo used philosophical allegory to harmonize Jewish scripture, mainly the Torah, with Greek philosophy. His allegorical exegesis was very important for some early church fathers who received his works with great enthusiasm, and they claimed that Philo might be Christian hiding his Christian faith. Many scholars say that Philo's concept of the word as God's creative principle greatly influenced early Christianity and that the writer of the Gospel of John quoted this concept from Philo. But while Philo had expressed it in a Jewish philosophical concept, the author of the Gospel of John has expressed it in a Christian philosophical concept. On the Embassy to Gaius, by Philo of Alexandria, Taylor Anderson Matt Stephon mentioned in his book, Judaism, History, Belief, and Practice, Philo's use of Greek philosophy, especially of Plato's philosophy, in aligning the Torah ideas with his concept of the word as a mediator between God and the world, has caused the founding of Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and the philosophical view of the early church fathers. Judaism, History, Belief, and Practice, by Matt Stephon, Hellenistic Judaism PAGE 39. 2. St. Justin Martyrs, Influenced by Greek Philosophy St. Justin Martyr. Latin, Iastinus Martyr, 100-165. As we mentioned earlier, the Jesuit translation mentioned in its introduction about the New Testament that St. Justin Martyr, who lived between the years 100 to 165, was the first to mention that Christians read Gospels in Sunday's meetings, without specifying what those Gospels are and without specifying if between them any of the four Gospels, and that they consider them works of the Apostles. The Church relies upon what St. Justin Martyr mentioned to prove the existence of Bibles in the middle of the second century. But if we review the biography of St. Justin Martyr, we find that he was greatly influenced by Greek philosophy and was one of the most prominent who interpreted the concept of word, logos, in the second century. Saint Justin Martyr also mentioned the existence of the true religion that preceded Christianity, saying that the seeds of Christianity, manifestations of works of the word throughout history, had already preceded the incarnation of Christ, and that many known Greek philosophers, including Socrates and Plato, whose philosophical works he, L.E., Saint Justin Martyr, learnt well, are considered unaware Christians, i.e., they followed Christian faith without they realize that. 3. Papias, influenced by the apocryphal Jewish books. As we mentioned in chapter 1 of this book, Eusebius of Caesarea wrote about Papias that, he was a man of very little intelligence, who was influenced by the apocryphal Jewish books and believed in the millennial kingdom heresy in its literal sense. 4. Clement of Alexandria, influenced by Greek philosophy. He was one of the most prominent advocates of the Gospel of John and was the head of the Cathedral School of Alexandria. 
Through his three most important books, it is apparent how deeply influenced by Greek philosophy and literature, especially Plato's philosophy and Stoic philosophy. More than any other Christian thinker of his time. His teacher was Saint Pantenus, Saint Pantenus the philosopher, who was a famous Greek Stoic philosopher, and he, i.e., Saint Pantenus, was a pagan and then converted to Christianity. And tried hard to reconcile the Greek philosophy he excels in with his new religion, Christianity. Saint Pantenus greatly influenced Christian theology through his work as head of the Cathedral School of Alexandria, and after his death, he was succeeded by Clement of Alexandria as head of the school. Clement of Alexandria was considered a saint in all of the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Church, and the Anglican Church. Just as the Roman Catholic Church previously considered him a saint and celebrated his feast on the 4th of December. However suddenly his name was erased from the record of the martyrs in the Roman Catholic Church in 1586 by order of the Pope Clement IV, and Pope Benedict XIV wrote a letter to the King of Portugal. John V, explaining enthusiastically that the reason behind this omission is based on the existence of some corrupt teachings in his writings. Among the pupils of Clement of Alexandria is Origen of Alexandria, c. 184, c. 253, who was one of the most influential figures in early Christian theology, and was described as the most brilliant genius produced by the early church. Origen of Alexandria succeeded Clement of Alexandria as head of the Cathedral School of Alexandria. However, the Coptic Church later deprived Origen of his priestly rank, and so did the Chalcedonian churches because of the dogmatic errors found in his writings. As well as he had castrated himself as a young man so that he could preach to women freely, as Eusebius of Caesarea mentioned about him, and the eunuch may not receive a priestly rank. 5. Many Early Church Fathers, Influenced by Greek Philosophy Many of the early church fathers who followed and supported the Gospel of John, when reviewing their biographies. We find how influenced by Greek philosophy, but will not mention them all here so that the book does not last long. 6. Tertullian's Hostility to Greek Philosophy Tertullian, who was dubbed, the father of Latin Christianity, and also, the founder of Western theology criticized the church's fathers who were philosophers or influenced by Greek philosophy and criticized the heresies and myths that they brought into the Christian religion, saying, What a relationship can be between Athens and Jerusalem, between the academy and the church, between heretics and believers. We are innocent of those who invented Stoic Christianity. Platonic Christianity, Epicurean Christianity, or dialectical Christianity after Christ and the Gospel. We do not need anything, is there any room for the analogy between the Christian and the philosopher, between the disciple of heaven and the disciple of Greece? between who aims life and who aims fame, between who builds and who destroys, between who maintains the truth and preaches it and who spoils it. The strange thing is that Tertullian himself fell into heresies and used Greek philosophy and the apocryphal Jewish books, as he was a believer in the millennial kingdom, in its literal sense. And he was also one of the founders of the doctrine of the Trinity, Holy Trinity, and incorporated it into the Christian religion. Even though the word, Trinity, was never mentioned by Jesus nor by any of his disciples, and never mentioned even in any of the four Gospels that the Church tries to attribute to the disciples. In the end, Tertullian fell into severe heresy and was a follower of the Montanian doctrine, Montanism, founded by Montanus, who falsely claimed prophecy. And Tertullian strongly defended Montanism and attracted many followers to it. 8 Attribution to Christ Phrases beginning with the word I in John's Gospel John's Gospel is the only Gospel that attributed many phrases to Jesus, starting with the word I, while none of these phrases is mentioned in any of the other Gospels. These phrases are always used by priests who support the idea of deity of Christ in their debates with priests and churches that oppose to the deity of Christ. Among these phrases, as I am the bread of life, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 6 35, 29 I know him. For I am from him, and he hath sent me. John 7 29. 12 I am the light of the world. John 8 12. 19 Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus, answered, Ye neither know me, nor my Father, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. John 8 19. 23 And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. John 8 23. 58 Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. John 8 58. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John 10 11. 30 I and my Father are one. John 10 30. 38 But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know, and believe, that the Father is in me, and I in him. John 10 38. 
25 I am the resurrection, and the life, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 11 25. 45 And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. John 12 45. I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me. John 14 6. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. 8 Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? 10 Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. 11 Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. 12 Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. 13 And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14 7-13 the American Bishop John Shelby Spong said, Among the conclusions that I have reached in my intensive five-year-long study of John's Gospel are these. 1. There is probably not a single word attributed to Jesus in this book that the Jesus of history actually spoke. This includes all the I am sayings and all of the farewell discourses. 2. There is no way that the fourth Gospel was written by John Zebedee or by any of the disciples of Jesus. The author of this book is not a single individual, but is at least three different writers' editors, who did their layered work over a period of 25 to 30 years. Fourth Gospel B3422062 Q counter equals 1. 9 The Church's Dependence on John's Gospel 2. Resist Heresies. The term church, which is used by many who talk about the church's war with heresies, is deceptive. Because it makes us imagine that there was one united church, and it was resisting those who went astray from the straight path and the right belief. Moreover, the truth is that the churches at that time were in a constant struggle with each other, divided and dispersed, without a clear and firm belief. Example of this is that most churches and most early church fathers believed in the millennial kingdom in its literal meaning. Among them, Papias, Polycarp, Irenaeus, St. Justin Martyr, Melito, Bishop of Sardis, Melito of Sardis, died c. 180. Tertullian, Hippolytus of Rome, Hippolytus of Rome, c. 170 e 235 ambrose bishop of milan ambrose c 340 c 397 nepos of egypt nepos and others and their opponents were very few and the belief of the millennial kingdom in its literal meaning prevailed and lasted for four centuries and it was not denounced in any of the ecumenical councils but the law of nicene faith nicene creed which was formulated in the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 CE at the invitation of Emperor Constantine the Great. Strengthened the doctrine of the Trinity and added a phrase saying, whose kingdom never ends, and this tacitly indicates that Jesus will not come to rule the earth for a thousand years. As it was believed. The question that arises now is. If the term, church, means the presence of one and united church and that whoever opposes it is a heretic. Then why did the doctrine of that united church change from faith in the millennial kingdom in its literal sense and became after the passing of four centuries faith in its symbolic meaning? The answer to this question is that the change of the doctrine of the church, in general, was due to power and authority and not unanimity in the argument. As the Council of Nicaea was held by order of Emperor Constantine the Great and under his direct supervision, and on this, the churches that could rely on the power of the emperor were the victorious churches at the end. That is why we find that, although the doctrine of the Millennium Kingdom in its literal sense expresses the opinion of the majority of the early Church Fathers, the opinion of the minority of the early Church Fathers is what ultimately triumphed. Thus, who was previously called heretic because of his belief in the symbolic meaning of the Millennial Kingdom, which is a belief contrary to the faith of most churches, he became called a saint. And he who believed in the literal meaning of the Millennial Kingdom became called heretic. As for the term, heresy also is a deceptive. Because the victor who relied on the power of the emperor or king called those who opposed him heretics and described them as deviating from the correct doctrine of the church. As for us in our time, we cannot know who was right and who was a heretic in the early centuries of the church. Because the victor has always burned the books of opponents and exiled them or even imprisoned them, and persecuted their followers. 
Thus, we do not know what the opponent's arguments were, except for what the victor wrote about them. Based on this, who can guarantee if the victor was mentioning the true sayings of his opponents, or he just affixed false statements to them to distort their image and their arguments? Moreover, if we condemn one of the early church fathers that he was a heretic without hearing his arguments, and based solely on the statements of the victorious one, then we will be like the judge who heard from someone his accusation against other person that he insulted him. And the judge ruled according to the complainant's statements without hearing the other person. The best example of this is the so-called, Arius heresy, if we ask any of the priests of our time about Arius, we will find that the response is one. Namely that Arius was the greatest heretic in the history of humanity. However, if we ask them, what the proofs of his heresy are, the response will be to invoke what his enemies wrote about him and what they attributed to him from sayings and creed. What is not known to many Christians today is that Arianism was not just a sect of Christianity, but was the dominant belief in most churches. Most European countries followed the Arius doctrine, and many European kings, emperors, and patriarchs were Arians. Saint Jerome said his famous saying, which shows how Arianism was the dominant doctrine, the world awoke with a groan to find itself Arian.